and welcome to Understanding Photography with Kim Ayres, episode 153. Um, if you're looking to improve your understanding of photography, then you've come to the right place. Make sure you subscribe, make sure you hit like, and uh, don't forget to tell your friends about it as well. Today we're going to be giving feedback on images being sent in. But in the meantime, we are currently live. Uh, make sure you leave a comment, uh, tell me where you're from, tell me what the weather's like. Let's get the chat started. Wrong one. <laughs> 153 episodes in and I still get caught out by the technology very frequently. Um, yes, so here we are, yes, live on YouTube, unless you happen to be watching the recordings, but don't forget to make sure you are, have subscribed. Like I said, if you can click like every now and again as well, somewhere down here, that also helps the algorithms uh, for YouTube too. Um, I can see we've got a few comments in already, so uh, well, here we go. We, uh, Robert from Texas says, How are, howdy all from an overcast Texas and happy Mother's Day. Of course, yes, in North America, it's Mother's Day today. Um, it might be another place in the world as well. So happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Um, Maggie says hello from a very overcast and damp Castle Douglas. Yes, it's been kind of threatening all day and the rain just started literally about five minutes ago. April says happy Mother's Day everyone from a sunny and warm day in uh, Long Island, New York. Rosemary says good morning from the state of Washington, USA. A sunny Mother's Day to all the mums among us. Uh, Pat says hi everyone from a doggedly, uh, doggedly bright minehead. Um, Sandra says, hi everyone from a warm and sunny Birmingham. Spring has finally arrived. That's always good to know. Susan's joined us, says hello from Kakubri, where it's just started raining. Oh, Kakubri's nine miles down the road, although it does have a weather system entirely of its own, I think. Uh, it doesn't always mean it's the same, of Gals, same as Gals for Douglas. Uh, Meg says hello everyone, and Nadia's joined us and also says hi everyone. So welcome, we have people, we have pictures. Um, and we have little error signs coming up saying YouTube is not receiving enough video to maintain smooth streaming. So therefore, you might experience a bit of buffering. So apologies for that. Seems to be a weekly occurrence now. Still haven't figured out quite what to do about it. However, <clears throat> so we've got two. We've got two people sent in for us, and one of those was Meg. So we're going to be talking a little bit about. Um, Yes, I, there's uh, stuff about noise, noise in the images and what to do about it or how to turn it to your advantage. That's going to be key to what we're going to be talking about there. Um, but first, I'm going to start with Rosemary. So Rosemary sent in a picture, said, uh, sent a message saying, thanks again for all your great tips you gave during the low to the ground challenge. The suggestions you had for using a macro lens were quite useful. Uh, sorry, were quite helpful. I've left my 105mm lens on the camera since then to get lots of practice and I've learned more than I expected. I mean, that's a great idea. It's always a good thing to do. If you don't like, you know, is, is if you've got a selection of lenses, stick one of them on the camera and force yourself to use it and nothing else for a week or two. Um, and I, you, you really then do start to learn the advantages. So, you know, say you've got a macro lens and you go for a walk in the woods, you know, instead of trying to take the, the pictures of the whole woods and the big trees, you find yourself looking out for the little detail. Alternatively, you've got a wide angle lens on and you go for a walk in the woods, you'll be approaching the woods in an entirely different way. So I think the lens that you've got set up on your camera forces you to come up with creative solutions, even if you see things where you wish you had the other lens. So yeah, keeping the lens stuck on the camera for a week or more is a really good idea. Um, so she goes on, my, method, my efforts to master sharp focus with my macro lens led to this image of pansies in a Grosch bottle. So let me um, find that for you. So, no, uh, I want to do that. Yes, there we go, hooray. Um, so she says, uh, goes on to say now, um, so this is uh, Rosemary's Pansy sitting in a, a Grosch bottle that's been, uh, this is the edited version. It says the, the original file included distracted elements that got cropped out, leaving the remaining image unbalanced. So then I tried flipping it. And so, yep, if we do that, yep. So you can see here, so she's flipped it the other way. Make sure I've got that, I suppose. So the original crop was that. And she's flipped it this way to try and give it a sort of balance it a little bit better, which she felt it did a bit, um, but goes on to say, um, aside from 
using content aware, which is not available in her post processing software, is there anything more she could have done to help it out? Okay, so this is an interesting one. So she has, uh, Rosemary sent me the original here. Um, so what I'll do is, let's just bring this one back up. Well, so this is the original, and what we can see is that here are the distracting elements. We've got a bit of chair here, we've got a bit of window frame here, perhaps a little bit of wire mesh um, there, but that's that's quite faded out. So what else could we have done? Okay, let's just open that then in Photoshop. And I'll just rearrange that part uh, to there. So, and we can see that basically the first thing that Rosemary has done. She's straightened it and then pulled this in and pulled this in and given it slightly more room on the right side and then uh, cropped that. And in fact, yeah, there we go. Um, and if we take a look at Rosemary's picture here, yeah, we can see that's pretty much what she's got there now. It's also maybe played with the contrast a little bit. Now, she was she felt it was a little unbalanced, so she went to um, let's go image rotate flip horizontal. So she flipped it this way around to see whether it gave a bit more balance, and felt that it did to an extent. But I think there's there's still something slightly problematic about it, and to a certain extent, for me, it is the fact that essentially the space that you've given it, whichever way around you do it, whether you do it this way around or this way around, is on the wrong side of the bottle. And the reason for this, let me let me kind of point out a little bit what I mean here. It doesn't matter which way around I go. Um, in fact, I'll tell you what, let's just flip, um, transform that so I can keep them on separate layers for a moment. So we've got that layer and that layer. And the point that, that I really want to make is essentially the way the shape of this curves. And what I can't help but feel is, okay, let's do this, let's give it a separate layer, is that what we've got here is you've got the pansies come around here and then you've got the Grolsch lid comes down here. And it feels like there's a curve that comes round, almost like, and obviously we're talking about our own various projections, that if you can imagine like this was a person with flowers in their hair holding a little tray out in front of them. So, <laughs> if you like, two eyes and a nose. Um, and as such, they're facing that way. So what I kind of want to have is more space on that side. So if I was to then recrop this, um, sorry about well, this one here, what I would really want is to have the space behind the figure. Um, oh, sort of done that again. Let's do. I thought it was already on content aware. It isn't. So we'll just now. You don't have to do content aware with. Oh, what's ah right? Okay, this is on the wrong. Right, that's the layer I want. <laughs> we go. No, it's still not doing it. It's still right. I've got to make sure I'm clicking on the layer here. I go to here. Right, that's and it's still not giving me content aware options. I have no idea why it has suddenly decided not to. This is silly. Okay. Suddenly content aware just isn't, doesn't seem to be ready right for me. I am obviously missing something probably really, really obvious. What if I duplicate that? Ah, there we go. We obviously didn't, just didn't want to do it with the background. Right, so let's do that and that. And now hit content aware and we have space on this side now to go back to your original problem of the fact that you um, if we look at your picture here over on this side you've got this piece of uh, you know the window frame however your natural solution for this rosemary is to just take the bottle and move it slightly to the right so that you give yourself more space on the left you don't have to mess around with content to wear. Um, just take this photo again, but move the bottle to the right. So the point being then that if we come back to um, our sense here is that we have 
the curve, we have our little <laughs> figure here with flowers in the hair carrying the, the Grolsch lid and that notion of there being space in front of the person. And so that to me feels a better kind of way about it than having the space on the other side. Likewise, if you were to flip it round on this side, um, okay, in this case, we're also going to have to, I don't know, we don't have to do that. All I've got to do is remove that, take that and just flip this image. I've been doing too much flipping without actually needing to. So edit, transform, uh, flip horizontal. We're doing it this way. So now you see it looks like, again, the, the same little, um, you know, and you've got to put an eye here and a nose there or something like that. And you can see this notion of the curve is this way. And it feels like we're facing in this direction. Because we're facing in this direction, it feels like you want to have more space in front of it. And that's all I'm trying to say. And I've got a long and complicated way around doing it. But essentially, it's understanding that notion that you've already got, with your original photo here, you've put, got more space on one side than the other. You've had that sort of sense of having more space on the right, but that was because you were cropping out the window frame that was on the left. You flipped to the image, because it didn't quite feel balanced, but you're still not 100% sure about it. And even though you've got the space on the left, you now don't have the space on the right, but you've turned the curvature of, of, the, um, of the kind of direction, really. So it, I think, to be honest, I think it's really something as basically simple as that, is, is about understanding the direction the, that the object f feels like it's going. Now, obviously, it's a bottle with pansies in, it's not a little mannequin. But I think just the idea of it is, is the way your mind kind of superimposes. That, in turn, is what gives it. So you kind of had a sense of flipping it around, but what you weren't so sure about is which side to have the space. And like I say, if you don't have content to wear, but you're just doing it on your windowsill, you can simply move it to the left or right. So I hope you found that one useful, Rosemary. But thanks very much for sending that in. OK, so you've got a couple more uh, comments here. April says, I like the bottle on the right better. I like the idea. Uh, Sandra says, love the bouquet uh, back background. Rosemary says, yes, exactly my issue. I'm happy to see that the errors are starting to offend my sensibilities. <laughs> oh, Fiji's joined us from India and says, good evening. Uh, Rosemary says, so much better with the side, um, with space to the side of the curve. Pat says, the bottle seems an affront to the beauty of the posy and the background. <laughs> <laughs> not a fond, no, not so fond of the, the Grolsch bottle then, um, there, Pat. Um, and Rosemary says, I need to learn to see these things while I'm shooting. Yeah, of course, but it's it's practice. You will, you know, I you, you photograph a lot. And the more we do it, the more we start to learn these things, you know. And you, you'll, you'll know it yourself. If you take this Grolsch bottle now and you go and stick it on your windowsill just after this podcast is open, it's over rather, move it to left or right, turn the bottle left or right, give it space to left or right. You'll see, you'll, you'll then see it. And now because you can see it, it means next time you come to photograph something similar, hopefully then that idea will also kind of present itself to you. Right, okay, so thank you very much, Rosemary. Um, now, next one, it, I, I will say it does, a fairly short episode, this one's going to be again. Um, if any of you, if anybody else sent anything in, go and check your drafts folder because it didn't make it. <laughs> I will do a wee reminder here that um, if you're wanting to get, if you're, the best way, one of the best ways of improving your photography and getting past the blind spots that we all have is to get feedback on your photography. And I even had experience of this myself this week on in a photo crowd uh, contest where um, I put in a put in a picture and it was expert reviewed and although I got a highly commended I didn't make the top 10 but I got feedback from the person who said the reason you didn't get I, I love 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 this photo the reason you didn't make a top 10 was because of this 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 and this and the moment she said that and the moment I looked at the photo I thought of course OK, that makes perfect sense. There was one issue which she said, which I thought, no, actually, I would still stick with what I'd done because that was an artistic, personal artistic decision. But that's fine. You're allowed to have that. Any feedback I give you, which you disagree with, which you feel actually, no, there was a I had a particular 
aesthetic interpretation for that, um, that's fine, that's okay. All I'm doing is raising possibilities for you. And that's what critique is about. People giving you critique and feedback is from their point of view. They might be missing something that you've got in mind. But there were these other points and I thought, well, you know, so that's great. And this is the part, this is the thing that no matter what level we get to, we will always have blind spots. Now, hopefully over time, we have fewer and fewer of them. But it can still happen. Now, everybody who watches this podcast is trying to improve their photography. Almost everybody. I know Pat enjoys watching it without, um, it doesn't leap out with the camera at every, but nearly everybody else who watches this podcast enjoys their photography and is trying to develop that photography. And one of the best ways you can get it is to get the feedback. Um, so, but, you know, if these podcasts get to know images sent in for feedback, there's a limit to what I can do. I, I, there's only a limited number of photo shoots that I do that are suitable for the podcasts or that the clients that I do them for would allow to be on the podcasts. So I can't just constantly talk about my own photography. Copyright wise, I can't go grabbing random pictures off the internet to review. Um, that's that's not an issue. So the only way this these podcasts continue is if you send me images. I can set challenges for you every week. We've kind of been down that road. And when I was setting a lot of challenges, we ended up with only uh, you know, five or six entries to all the challenges. So I realized I can't do those all the time. So if you don't send me anything, if nobody sends me anything, these podcasts will wind up because there will be no content for them or they will end up being once a month or something like that. Um, but it's in your interest. It's in your interest to send your photos in uh, because you will get feedback. You will learn from the experiences. So just needed to kind of say that again, give you a little reminder um, to send me your images. Now, um, I'll come on to Meg's and then um, I will tell you what's coming up next week because actually I'm going to set another challenge. Um, and in two weeks time, I'm going to tell you about what's going on there and then in three weeks. So stick around. Um, right. OK. So um, what's our, uh, where are we? Um, Meg. Right. So basically what happened was uh, yeah, I did a I, uh, did a photo shoot about two or three weeks ago and I took Meg along with me. So this was a collaborative shoot with um, uh, Circle Vintage. Now, some of you may remember I've, I've done collaborative shoots with them before. So Circle Vintage are a um, vintage clothing store. So they do anything generally from the 1960s through to the 1990s, although they have some earlier pieces as well. And then in turn, they've got close collaboration and so came on board as well, was a local hairdresser, um, Nelson Brown and his small team. And so we, and we had a couple of models. And so we did a really fun, interesting photo shoot. Now, the photos for those will be shown at Spring Fling in two weeks time. I'll tell you more about that afterwards. In the meanwhile, Meg came along for the shoot um, to sort of watch what was going on. And I gave her one of my old bridge cameras to play with. And she took a bunch of behind the scenes photos. Now, the basic problem that Meg had was one of the fact that this old bridge camera, which is, I don't know, probably something like about 14 or 15 years old, wasn't able to cope with the low light very well. I was using flashes and I had my big fancy camera. Meg's using a bridge camera with a small sensor in just you know, a kind of dull yellow overhead light, a little bit of daylight coming through the window. And there wasn't really enough light for her camera to be able to cope with it. So let me show you one of the photos that she came up with. So here what we can see is we've got Vanessa here sitting in the chair while uh, Nelson and Mark here are just putting final touches to her hair before she comes over to sit into the place for the bit of the shoot that we're going to be doing. And in the background, which you can't see because my head's in the way, but I'll, I'll show you in a minute when I drag it into Photoshop, we've got Danny, who's one half circle vintage standing in the corner watching. Now, the problem with this, so this is the, the straight out of the camera. Um, so Meg took this photo, quite a strong kind of backlight, you know, there's the white here, everything's kind of a bit in shadow. And as we move in, you can see it's 
it's a noisy kind of image to it. Um, I think now the thing is, it's only something like yeah, yeah, four hundred four hundred ISO. Now four hundred ISO on a modern camera is nothing. You wouldn't get anything like that. But this is not a modern camera. This is fifteen years old, and it's a bridge camera. And it, it these things work really nicely in strong daylight, but they're not designed for uh, low light situations. Now she also had it. Let me just. What was the speed? Um, now this was set at four hundredth of a second, which seems a very fast shutter speed. But then I don't. The thing is, is I think this was done on auto settings. Um, Meg wasn't playing around with the um, with manual settings. This was done on auto. So the camera has decided that it needs four hundredth of a second. It didn't need anything like that. Could have happily dropped down to one hundred sixtieth of a second, and as such, probably had a one hundred ISO and worked better or gone a bit brighter. So. This is where the problem is that sometimes the camera auto settings don't necessarily make the best decisions. Also, we're talking about auto settings on a camera that's 15 years old. Auto settings on modern cameras tend to be much better. So the thing is, is what can you do about it? I re there's, there's something in this photo. There's something nice about the composition, about what's going on with it. But, okay, let me just close um, Rosemary's picture there and let's let's just sort of see if I duplicate that layer and I filter and I go to camera raw filter and we just first of all what we do is we brighten it up so that we can see Vanessa and the people that are going on a bit better and that's a that's a now it is kind of making this white bit very bright um, we can take the highlights down yeah, can kind of do that a bit that maybe helps a little. Um, but at this point, maybe if we boost the shadows up a, a touch more, let's get a little bit more detail into here. There's a, a bit of a nasty yellow cast because this is just coming from an overhead light. And But now we've messed, ar messed around with it like this, when we go in, I mean, the noise is terrible. It's really, and, and it's, so what do we do? We go to the detail and we do noise reduction. And I start smoothing that out and a color noise reduction because it's quite noisy there. Just bring that, that up there. So, But by the time I get to a level whereby I've done decent noise reduction, color's still a bit off. But this is now looking really soft, too soft and blurry. We've lost all this detail in the hair. Um, it's, it's not really the best kind of option. I mean... Maybe I would do also, like I say, with that color, yellow color shift, um, what else would we do? We would maybe go and slide it into the blue a bit to make it look a little bit more natural. And that kind of looks better for her. But now actually the background has become over blue because the daylight outside was already a kind of blue shifted compared to the yellow shift of the lights. So by yellow blue shifting it to counteract the lights, we've now gone over blue in the background. So you can start to see that there's a lot of complications with this photo and the fact that the, the camera settings aren't coping with it. So what can we do instead? Let's go back to this here. And the obvious thing with the color problem is to, is to go black and white. Um, so if I... Now the thing is, is... The other thing is, it's not just black and white. It's black and white with the noise. Is what we do is instead of um, trying to run away from the noise and smooth it out, we go for a different kind of photo. And there is a whole area of photography, which if you think of kind of documentary, newspaper, magazine, music press kind of photography from the 1950s, 60s, 70s, which was black and white and grainy, okay? When, um, back in the day of analog, when people were using um, high ISO film to take photos in low light situations, which ended up with a kind of a grain. And, and now what we have is we have digital noise, which has a similar kind of effect. So if we tap into that as a, an aesthetic style for the photo, it gives us a different way of doing things. So in this case, what I do is, yeah, copied that. Now, if I go to Camera Raw, what I might decide to do, let's click Auto, and that's kind of 
it's playing a bit we'll maybe take those highlights down a little bit more but I'm going to take the saturation and I'm going to take the saturation down like that now at this point what we want to do is we want to start kind of playing with the contrast a little bit but also let's maybe play with the clarity ah clarity is doing it nice that's giving us much more um, now I'm going to take that those highlights down a bit the clarity up the contrast up a touch more and maybe I think what I might do with this is vignette it just a little bit on the corners. I'm going to be slightly careful here because I don't want to lose Danny completely. But when we look at that, I think that's now really got something much more going for it. Um, we have a sense of, now it is noisy, but it's it, you can kind of get away with it a bit more. Now, Slight, slight problems with this this older one is is less noise and also because it was a JPEG, not a raw raw, uh, raw file that we're starting with. It's got this kind of interlacing effect here, which I don't overly like very much. So at this point, what I'm tempted to do is actually add more noise, but in a kind of limited way. So if I duplicate that layer again and I go to filter noise, add noise and then what I can do is, now if I have too much noise, you can see it just gets, that that's no good. Um, and what I, but what I want to do is I want to create just enough noise to get rid of that nasty little effect that was going on. So in this case, I think if I go to something like, yeah, by the time we get to about 4.8, that's maybe about as far as I want to go. And now, it's looking a little bit more noisy, but then what I might actually do is I'm going to blur the noise very slightly because it's very sharp and hard. So if I go to blur, blur Gaussian or Gaussian blur, and again, we don't want it too blurred. We don't want it, we don't want it. We're just kind of nudging it a little bit. And in this case, I think something like about 0 0.5. And so we've gone from we changed the quality of the noise. If I can zoom in a little bit more here so you can see that. So that's what was and that's what is. And I think our new version of noise just sort of looks a slightly more natural kind of noise rather than the funny kind of um, way the, 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 the Fuji bridge camera had kind of interpreted things going on. So now it's it's really got much more of that kind of um, old film look to it and at this point let's just double check the levels yeah there's I thought there was maybe a bit dark we can see on the histogram down here it's a bit dark so I grab the levels and I drag them up and I'm not going to worry too much about it being too bright in the background because really it's about making sure we've got enough going on with these faces here and at that point I think what we've got well, like I say it kind of looks more like a newspaper photo or, or a magazine photo I think it's got it's got that kind of documentary feel to it what Meg's managed to capture rather beautifully is something going on nobody's posing for the camera nobody's aware of it nobody's looking at her nobody's worrying about it we've got our model sitting here hands in her lap just feeling her hair being done we've got Nelson over here making spraying bits onto the hair and pulling me we've got uh, Mark with the um, with the hairdresser uh, sorry, with the hairdryer. Um, and so this is giving us, the, you know, I think the aesthetic for this is a great way of getting around that problem of um, not enough light, colour noise, um, all these kind of things going on. Now, let's. Um, what I'm going to do is just to show you that this isn't a, a one-off, that you can use it. And you, know, you can't use it all the time, but it does. It is one of those things which you can work. Here's another photo that Meg took. So here's a photo she took of Danny. Um, and so if I open this one with Photoshop. So again, what we've got is we've got a basic problem of the fact that you can see the yellow light now of the, the hair salon where we are. Um, we've got this horrible kind of quality of, of noise and mess kind of in the in the, the quality of the picture. So what we do with this, first of all, we just straighten the background. So we make sure that the horizontal, the, the verticals are kind of feeling like we're in there. Then we don't need all that bit in the background. We could go for a kind of square crop. The problem with the, the, the square crop though is we end up with, um, yeah, if I just, if I just kind of just do that, just show you a rough square crop with that. But the problem is I think this great, 
chunk of doorway here is isn't really giving us any more so what we do is maybe just pull that in now we go and go for a just a more kind of slightly portrait crop we can't get rid of the door completely because we still just like the curve in um, <laughs> in the Grosch bottle of rosemary we're wanting to have a little bit more space in front of rather than behind so we just kind of slide Danny over slightly to the left we've got a little bit of space here um, and I think that kind of crop but now what we can do is we can we can apply the same kind of idea. So I'll duplicate that layer. If I go to now camera raw and we go to we we let's auto maybe just sort of see what happens, brightens up. Take the saturation down. Now we want to be careful here because Dan's face has gone is relatively dark compared to other things here. So actually what I want to do is I want to take that exposure up a bit more to make sure that we're not losing it now this is kind of blowing out highlights up here but in a way again it doesn't really matter so much the aesthetics of those kind of old photos is very often you do find blown highlights but it's a case of just making sure they're not distracting and now at this point I can grab this clarity tool and start adding a bit more texture go maybe a bit more contrast here something like that um, and maybe bring the shadows up a touch more, maybe even take the exposure up a little bit more, something like that. And again, let's, let's add a little bit of a vignette in so we're kind of darkening down the top and bottom just to kind of draw our attention back in towards Dan. And again, I think what we have here then is a more interesting kind of, um, like, like that kind of music press style photo. Dan with the glasses on looking very kind of cool and rock and roll as is. Again, if I duplicate that layer, if I zoom in here, there's something about the quality of the, the digital noise in here which I don't really like. And so again, I think I would go to filter noise and I would add the noise. Uh, maybe need a, just a touch more on that. I will actually take that one up to uh, maybe six on that. Yeah, I think six is probably about right on that. But again, it's then too sharp with the noise. The the noise, the, the little pixel, the digital pixels are just that little bit too sharp. Um, so I'm then going to blur that noise as well, but only very, very fractionally. And that 0 0.5, I think is probably about right again. So again, if I just zoom in here, the difference between I don't know how much is coming across on your screen, to be honest. On my computer, it's really obvious. But the the without has these sort of nasty little artifacts, which the noise itself is actually kind of evening it out. So adding that little bit of noise and then blurring that noise just fractionally is now making it look so much more like an analog high ISO photo rather than um, the digital noise of a... Uh, a digital camera that isn't that just is struggling too much to cope with it and then when we end up with that I think again we've what we've got here is a cool photo of Dan looking looking like it you know is, is kind of rock star self um, and when we compare that to the original photo um, I think this is a considerably better way of doing it so that's really kind of what I wanted to um, talk about with that is that if you find yourself in a situation, let me just close those windows. If you find yourself in a situation whereby the camera is, you know, you've taken your, your, your shot, it's, and it works particularly well with situations where you've got people in action, you've got people on the move, whether it, that it's at a bat, you know, at a concert where people are playing or street photography. Uh, but these kind of observational things where somebody's moving towards one, something else, or people are involved in things. They, yeah, it's that kind of documentary slash street slash performance kind of photos, which and the camera just isn't coping with the low light situation. And the ISO is boosting up and you're getting, not just getting noise, but you're getting horrible color noise spreading throughout it. Then I think very often those particular styles of photos, you can lend you tap into that aesthetic of the kind of 50s, 60s, 70s music press 
where you can go black and white and you can use that noise to your advantage because it's part of the aesthetic. So often we are chasing to create as smooth an image as possible. And I'm often talking about this. I'm often saying, look, you know, try and go to the 100 ISO if you can. You know, if you don't need a 400 of a second shutter speed, drop to a 200th of a second shutter speed so that you can have a smoother, you know, a better quality ISO. And most of the times, the better your ISO, the more editing options you then have afterwards because of it. But if you find that you just, doesn't matter what you do, you, you end up with this, then this is a particular way of clawing it back. So I hope you found that useful. Um, okay, let's, uh, got a couple more comments on in here. Um, Rosemary says, what's the difference? What is the difference in kinds of noise reduction? Well, <laughs> most noise reduction involves some kind of blurring it, really. Um, and depending on the software that you're using, go into the noise reduction and play around with the sliders until you find something that's working for you. But you've got to be careful how far you nudge it until it stops looking normal. There are um, filters that people are sometimes using on their cameras where you're trying to soften skin or something like that and it just ends up looking false. The minute something starts looking false, you've gone too far. Okay, so yeah, I, noise reduction is basically go into your software, see what options there are and play with it. And it's not necessarily that one will always work better than another. Sometimes it varies slightly depending on the, on the picture you've got and the starting point you're at. Uh, Sandra says the conversion to black and white gives the photo a documentary feel. Yes, that's that's it exactly. You can get away with things in that kind of documentary way that, say, a fashion photo or, you know, a high-end portrait, you just couldn't get away with it. Um, April says looks very old-fashioned. Nice. Maggie says love the grainy atmosphere. April says uh, Dan is good in the black and white version. Yeah, absolutely. Sandra says the photo of Dan in black and white looks so much better. And Meg says I will take on board what you're saying and your comments about the photos. And Rosemary says I really like those conversions with the added grain. Excellent. Right. Well, I hope that I hope you found that useful. OK, so what I'm going to talk about now, don't rush off. Um, setting up now for, because Part of what's going on is in two weeks time, in two weeks time, it is, uh, is spring fling. Now, for those who've been around for the last couple of years, you'll, you, might, you might remember that. Basically, spring fling is an open studio event across Dumfries and Galloway. And this year, there are a hundred studios opening up um, of artists and makers uh, across the entire region, which you can go and visit. And uh, each year, or most years, Maggie and I both tend to be in Spring Fling. Maggie with her art, me with my photography, and we're sharing a space as we did last year. If you happen to be in or near Dumfries and Galloway, get hold of one of these Spring Fling brochures. We can flick through. If we go to Studios uh, 44 and 45, here's me, here's Maggie, here's the blurb about us, and where you can find us. So we're Studios 44 and 45 on the Pink Crete. If you can't get a hold of one of those, go to the Spring Fling, which I think is spring-fling.co.uk website. And again, it's all online as well. How to find it, um, sat nav directions, all these kind of things. And if you can come along in two weeks time, please do. I'm going to be putting on a photography demonstration on how to pose in front of the camera. And I will have photos on the wall. Maggie will have pictures on the wall. I think Meg's even planning on doing a little bake, bit of um, home baking as well. So lots to come along for. What that means for those of you who aren't local, who can't get along to Spring Fling weekend, is there won't be a, um, a podcast in two weeks time. So on the 28th of May, I'll be busy doing Spring Fling. I won't be able to do a live podcast. Now, either side of that, what I've decided to do is, so next week I'm going to talk about reflections, okay? Um, I was sent a, an image a couple of weeks ago which sparked the idea um, of reflections. So I'm going to talk about that, that the photo that was sent in. And if anybody else wants to send in any photos um, for critique feedback, well, you know, why not theme it a little bit? Or if you're struggling a bit with reflection, now re reflections in water, reflections in glass, uh, maybe reflections in a mirror. But, uh, you know, um, if, if you're struggling with something, you would like a little bit of help beforehand, before this, um, before I then set a challenge, then 
next week's your opportunity to do that. So sec either go to the Facebook group, Understanding Photography with Kim Ayres, stick your image in that, or email me, kim at kimayres.co.uk. Um, and then, so I'm gonna then talk about, so I'll give a bit of feedback on any images that are sent in um, next week, but I will also be talking about this notion of reflection and then setting a reflection challenge, which I really want you to have fun with. And I think the stuff, the image, the, the content that I give you next week, hopefully will inspire you. Now, and then you will have two weeks. That will give you two weeks to go out and take your photos for the reflection challenge. Then you can send the images in. And then the week after Spring Fling, um, somewhere else about the 4th or 5th of June, whichever one that is, uh, the Sunday is, um, we'll look through all the images and um, and, uh, and see how we can inspire each other with uh, the reflection challenge. So I hope you will take uh, all that on board. I'll tell you again, so next week I'll tell you more about the reflection challenge and next week I'll also give you a reminder about Spring Fling if you happen to be nearby. So that's pretty much about it. A uh, quick reminder that if you find these podcasts useful, entertaining, um, or whatever, and you would like to support them, then buymeacoffee.com forward slash Kim Ayers is one of the ways you can do it. And of course, don't forget to subscribe and click like for these as well. Uh, I can see we've got a couple more um, comments here. What have we got? Oh, Susan says, uh, did anyone else notice that Dan has the same curve as the pansies, his head, shoulder, and arm? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it, and that kind of is... Thinking about where I crop it um, makes makes a difference with that. And April says, just curious, is it expensive to rent a space at your spring fling in the UK? I love you guys that you guys have that. Um, now, the thing is with spring fling is it's a selected uh, thing. So you, it's for artists in the in the region, artist makers in the region. Uh, they have certain, if you are on the boundaries, if you live in the county next door, you can apply. But all the open studios happen within Dumfries and Galloway, this corner of Scotland. Um, so you apply for it in usually in October. If you're accepted, then you, you're allowed to be in the Spring Fling for the following May. Most, it, it be, the idea being an open studios event means that most people are then operating out of their own studio. So you can go along to their studios and you can see their workspace and they will clean and tidy everything up, get the tools out of the way, try and stop it being a health and safety hazard for visitors to come in. And you can then talk directly with the artists. You can buy directly from the artists. You can commission directly from the artists. And it's a really fun event. And with over 100, you can't possibly see all 100 uh, you know, across the weekend. So you pick up your catalogue, you go through, you decide who you really want to see, you mark it all in a red felt pen, and then you try and fit in as many as you can. And you circle about 30 of them, and in the end you get to see about 10. But that's always <laughs> kind of the fun of Spring Fling. Um, so yeah, but most people are operating out of their own space. Some people like, I don't actually have a studio. All the photography I do is on location. So I've got friends who've got an outbuilding who've lent me the space. Logistically, it worked out a lot easier for me and Maggie to share that space. It's quite a large space, so we happen to be doing that this year rather than Maggie operating out of her studio. Maggie's studio is also quite small and doesn't cope very well with large numbers of visitors. When you get more than about four people in, it feels really very cramped. So um, so I, I think hope that answers your question there, April. And... Um, and yeah, Maggie says also that it, yes, it's for professional artists and makers. Part of the application there is in the application is that you you have to be it's part of your living. It's it's not uh, it's not just an amateur hobby. So it's a selected thing for professional artists and makers in the region. So hope that gives you an answer there. But I'll remind you again about Spring Fling next week, and of course there will be the um, the. Uh, the reflections challenge as well so thank you very much to rosemary and thank you very much to meg for sending me images i hope you've both found these things um useful and uh thank you to everybody who's uh, joined in given comments said hello left left comments and all the rest of it and make sure you send in your images for next week i look forward to seeing you then take care bye bye